Um, all right. Now you can just count down 30 seconds. <laughs> And the attendees are now starting to join. Um, welcome to everyone. So when you hear us making a cross, okay. Well, at least you we might don't know where she went. Did she say she was? <laughs> she left. Well, uh, welcome to everyone and thank you very much for joining uh, us today in the second webinar of the series on self-determination. My name is Carlos Bosch. I'm a professor at Princeton University and joining with uh, LISD and Professor uh, um, Clara Ponsati, a member of the European Parliament. We are organizing this series. Uh, although we explained the set of questions and problems that pushed us to organize this webinar series in the first session, let me summarize it just for uh, those who are joining us today for the first time. Uh, the general principle of self-determination is part of the international legal order as recognized by the foundational charter of the United Nations, but the practical implications of such a right or even the definition of the subjects entitled to it are not obvious. Indeed, uh, Professor Tushnet addressed the, the latter point, how to define the subject with that right in our October meeting. Hence, uh, given the relevant and the fundamental nature of questions of self-determination in relation to democratic principles, shouldn't there be some consensus among democratic states, societies, and institutions as to how to address them? And our aim with this seminar series is precisely to contribute uh, in terms of searching for this consensus or uh, at least some guidance to the question, how should democratic societies and institutions address questions of self-determination? Um, before Clara introduces to you uh, today's our speaker today, uh, let me point out a, a few logistical details. As we did in the previous session, Professor Tierney will speak to us for about 35 minutes, and there, there will have some time uh, for all of us for questions and discussion. You can indicate that you would like to take the floor in the chat box or just write your question in the question and answer section. In addition, and for your information, we are web streaming and recording the event, which will be later available at the Institute's YouTube uh, channel, and it will be shared in the social networks. So once again, again, welcome to everyone, and in particular to Professor Steven Tierney, uh, who Clara will introduce to you. Clara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlos, for your opening remarks, and thank you all for joining us today. I would like to give a very warm welcome to all students, academic community, staff and members of the European Parliament, and other citizens interested on the topic that are joining us today. Thank you very much for being here. I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, the Institute, uh, the Einstein Institute for uh, Self-Determination for their continued support on this webinar semi seminar series. Uh, I am Clara Ponsati, a member of the European Parliament, and I'm very, very excited to uh, listen to what uh, our invited for today is going to be speaking about in this second seminar of the series on self-determination. Professor Tierney, holds a chair on constitutional theory at the School of Law at the University of Edinburgh and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He's a member of the Judicial Appointments Board for Scotland and a legal advisor to the House of Lords Constitutional Committee. He has also served as the editor of the UK Constitutional Law Blog from 2015 until 2012. 20, and as a constitutional advisor to the Scottish Parliament uh, Referendum Bill Committee in 2013 and 14. His research interests are in UK comparative constitutional law, and he has published widely and importantly uh, on constitutional aspects, including on federalism and uh, referenda. So he has advised also governments and parliaments widely on exit, Brexit, devolution, and constitutional change. 
So in today's talk, Professor Terni will discuss referendums in federal states, territorial pluralism, self-determination, and the challenge of direct democracy. So Professor Terni, I'm delighted to give you the floor. Thank you, Madam Ponsati, and to Professor Boix and everyone else who's organized this. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a PowerPoint presentation, um, which I, I think will be organized um, from the Princeton end. So um, I'm not sure if it's possible to share that. Oh, it is. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so first slide, simply the, the title of the talk, as Madame Ponsati said. So turning to the next slide. Um, the paper that I'll give today addresses the use of referendums specifically in federal systems. And I argue that we cannot really understand the place of referendums in a federal state in the context of self-determination until we have a clearer idea of the constitutional theory of federalism and of federalism's fundamental constitutional purpose. On the other hand, the referendum itself, when held on matters of fundamental uh, constitutional nature, particularly self-determination, acts as a mirror, forcing us to confront the very nature of federalism as a specific type or family of constitutionalism. I should say that in a book that um, I've just completed, which I'll publish next year called The Federal Contract, I argue that federalism is a specific family of constitutional government um, and that its conceptual underpinnings, in fact, I argue are largely unexplored. And I think constitutional referendums um, on self-determination help expose just how much thinking there is still to do about federalism itself. Another background factor for the paper is that we operate in an age of constitutional rigidity on the one hand and constitutional vulnerability on the other. So we live in a world of ever more elaborate constitutions, longer, more detailed constitutions and attempts to entrench constitutional values ever more deeply through eternity clauses, unamendable constitutional provisions, the empowerment of the judicial branch. But on the other hand, the referendum is emerging um, perhaps as a response to this, perhaps as part of an urge by people to take control of constitutions away from elites, and in so doing to overturn the idea of the constitution as a settlement. And the self-determination issue obviously um, applies in that context. So a key question in contemporary debates is how best to reach an appropriate balance between open democratic decision-making on the one hand and constitutional entrenchment on the other. And the referendum comes right into this debate um, in the how question, how should constitutional change take place? Should it, like general lawmaking, lie exclusively in the hands of representatives or should the people have a direct say? And if so, on what issues? So in the paper, I tried to bring together two things. The idea of federalism as a very specific kind of constitutionalism based upon territorial pluralism and the role of the referendum as an agent of popular constitution making. So how should the referendum as a mechanism of constitutional change be accommodated specifically within federal thought and federal practice, given that federalism has emerged as a carefully crafted balance of power among a polity's constituent territories? So that's the key question. And self-determination brings to the fore um, the very difficult question that that is um, in, in a federal system. The, the attempt to balance entrenchment on the one hand um, with increasing popular demand for popular decision making. So in the paper, I begin by summarizing the rise of federalism and the rise of the referendum in, in recent times. I don't suggest the two are connected, but it's, it's interesting that many of the, the most interesting innovations in referendum practice have taken place in federal states. I then look at criticisms of referendums from the perspective of democracy. Um, I then turn to explore um, how the intervention of the people in constitutional change upsets many of our understandings of constitutional stability. Um, and finally, I, I 
conclude by looking at how referendums in particular challenge um, the pluralization of the people um, in, a, in a federal context. So if we turn to the next slide, um, Now, I realize that's quite difficult to see. It's not, it's not a particularly important slide in terms of the detail. What I do in, 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 in this part of the paper is simply point out that since 1945, um, it's been estimated that approximately one third of states have adopted or moved towards a federal constitutional system. And many of the most vivid developments in the development of federalism have happened quite recently. Um, and often in very complex territorial situations, such as Bosnia, Herzegovina, Iraq, and so on. At the same time, the proliferation of direct democracy is something that we see. I, I identify four different areas here where referendums are growing in practice, the founding of new states, the creation and amendment of new constitutions, the creation of sub-state autonomy, and within the European Union, whether in treaty making, in uh, the expansion of membership of the European Union, and most recently, obviously, in exit from the European Union. And it's interesting that a lot of these developments are happening in federal or territorially decentralized states. Um, so in traditional systems like Australia, Switzerland, Canada, and the UK, um, we also see pressure for referendums in Spain, um, a major factor in the 1990s was the collapse of the federal USSR and the federal Yugoslavia. And we've seen devolution um, and secession referendums, as I say, in the UK, in Canada and in Spain. So, and also if you think of the European Union in federal terms, then obviously a lot of referendums have taken place in relation to the EU. So moving to the next slide. What interested me in the proliferation of referendums in an earlier book I wrote called Constitutional Referendums was essentially the question, are referendums democratic? Now, this is an age old debate. For some people, it's an intuitive assumption that referendums represent an ideal model of democracy. Voters are called upon to speak um, as one unified people, deciding on an issue directly without the mediation of politicians what could be more democratic? But in fact, among constitutionalists and political historians, referendums have a bad name. In addressing the history of referendum practice, it is the very mobilization of direct popular rule that is a problem because it unleashes dangers which constitutions are specifically designed to prevent. If the core purpose of modern constitutionalism is the regulation and management of political power, domesticating it through the concept of constitutional authority, then the referendum can be seen as a threat. It has the potential to release raw political power as a potential trump card in relation to the otherwise careful conditioning of that power by the constitution. So it's, it, it can be seen as the raw constituent power somehow trumping or superseding um, carefully crafted constitutional provisions. There are three main objections that inform the scepticism. Um, one is that referendums lend themselves by definition to elite control and hence to the manipulation by organizers of referendums, the elite control syndrome. So referendums seem very democratic, they seem to be the people speaking, but in fact, it's um, a referendum as a process that the elites who manage the process control, the people don't really have, have much of a role beyond turning up and voting. A second objection is that there's an inbuilt tendency in the referendum process simply to aggregate preformed opinions rather than to foster meaningful deliberation. So again, a referendum might be presented as a very deliberative process, but in fact, people turn up and vote according to party cues or from other prejudiced positions, and there's not necessarily much deliberation or changing of minds going on at all. A third objection is that referendums consolidate and even reify simple majoritarian decision making at the expense of minorities and individual interests, the majoritarian danger, which is very familiar. 
Now, these objections are highly salient, um, but it's my contention that the first two are either ideologically informed um, or they are largely problems of practice, which can be overcome by careful referendum design and adequate regulation. I don't have time to go into those two objections for now. The one I want to focus upon today is the majoritarian danger. And I think this is the most problematic for people who promote or at least defend the use of referendums. And it's also the issue that has the greatest potential to bring the referendum into direct conflict with constitutionalism, federal or otherwise. Unlike the other two criticisms, the issue of major majoritarianism is one that unavoidably leads to competing positions based upon ideology. As I say, the first two objections, I think, can be overcome by careful referendum design. But the majoritarian danger is a much greater existential dispute between different views of democracy. Those who oppose the use of referendums in constitutional change will often cast it as a threat to carefully crafted counter majoritarian provisions within a constitution. Now, those who, on the other hand, advocate or at least defend the use of the referendum tend to bring to the debate a very different ideological disposition. It's too simplistic to, to call these two rival sides liberal constitutionalism on the one hand and civic republican constitutionalism on the other, but we don't have a lot of time, so I'll use those as Manichaean counterpoints um, for the purpose of our, our discussion today. And I think that caricature can be quite useful. So a civic republican attitude to constitutionalism tends to be sceptical of entrenching externally constructed moral values. Civic republicans are quite wary of entrenchment in constitutions, and in, particularly, in particular, they're wary of very detailed entrenchment, in particular of political values. Um, Republican approaches consider it better if political values are left open to the public sphere and to political contestation. Constitutionalism is important to protect the institutions of a constitutional system, but decision-making around political ideas should be made through the cut and thrust of political debate. Building upon this, it's accepted that majoritarian decision making is an inevitable part of constitutional life and is usually the fairest way to reach decisions. Civic Republicans go further. They argue that a, um, open constitutionalism is important because it promotes an active, engaged demos, which has the democratic right to make important constitutional decisions. Um, so the citizen, the citizen has the opportunity to grow as a politically knowledgeable and engaged actor through the responsibility of active engagement, particularly in fundamental decisions such as self-determination. Um, so there's no automatic mapping of a general civic Republican outlook onto the conclusion that referendums are a good mechanism with which to engage the public in constitutional change. But there are two ish features specific um, to important constitutional decision making, including self-determination, which from a civic Republican perspective, make direct democracy potentially attractive. The first concerns the significant significance of the issue at stake. When we're talking about self-determination, we're talking about the very framing or reframing of a democratic system of government. Arguably the direct engagement of the people is essential when we are dealing with such a fundamental question. Either to make the decision or to ratify self-determination efforts concluded by elites. Um, this argument builds upon, of course, a whole range of different work. One example would be Bruce Ackerman's distinction between constitutional politics and ordinary politics. Um, and that it is in the former that there is a particularly compelling case for citizen engagement. Now, as I say, that's not to say a referendum follows axiomatically from this point of view, um, but arguably it is a, a simple and obvious way to achieve the result of citizen engagement. A second argument is that in making self-determination decisions, 
a constitution that emerges from this process is not only constitutive of a polity, but self-constitutive of the subjects of the polity. So the people involved are not only creating a new constitution, in a way they are creating themselves as a new body of citizens of a new republic. Um, the constitution takes on a symbolic representational role encapsulating the very identity of the people. So again, that raises a very strong argument that the people should be very much involved in that process. Um, and although the referendum is not the, an automatic way to do this, um, when we think about the totemic nation building potential that comes um, in a self-determination decision, then it seems intuitively attractive that a referendum takes, the role, takes a role in that process. So in other words, referendums are good or at least defensible because the people have a prima facie right of direct engagement in constitutional decisions that go to the heart of the question, who are we as a constitutional people? So next slide, please. I then turn to how federalism fits within this whole debate. Um, I argue that federalism has to be understood through the particular methodology of constitutional theory. I can't unpack that for now. Maybe we can get go there in questions. Um, but I argue that as a particular form of constitutional government, we find the purpose of federalism from the self-declaration of a federal constitution as to what it's trying to achieve. And I argue that federalism as a genus of constitutional government for the modern state, which in the Act of Constitutional Union gives foundational recognition and accommodation to the state's constituent territorial pluralism. The purpose of the federal constitution is both to reflect this foundational pluralism and to maintain the relationship between pluralism and union in the creation and reconciliation of different orders of government. So in short, I think we can summarize the core constitutional purpose of federalism as being the constitutional accommodation of territorial pluralism. And I argue that this has fundamental implications for the anatomy of federal constitutionalism in terms of its foundations, its subjecthood, its authority, its design and its dynamics of constitutional change. In other words, federalism is a radical fork in the road within modern constitutionalism. It is not always treated that way. Quite often, or most often, it is encapsulated as um, simply one particular form of decentralized um, constitutional rule within one universalizable conception of constitutional authority. Um, so I, I don't accept that. I think federalism is a radically different form of government and should be explored as such. And that I think has implications for both how referendums are used in, ref in federal systems and how we think about self-determination in federal systems. So next slide, please. I argue that there's been little attention given within constitutional theory to the implications um, of federalism for how processes of constitutional change ought to be structured. Um, as building blocks to a discussion of referendums, I think we can discuss two issues. The, the general issue of how re entrenchment fits within federal design and whether particular aspects of design require specific protection within federal constitutionalism. Federal constitutions are certainly consistent with the modern trend of written constitutions. They are entrenched by way of particular and often highly complex amendment processes. There's even evidence to suggest that federal constitutions are particularly difficult to change among constitutional systems. Um, because of the very demanding levels of counter or super majoritarian constraint. We, pardon me, we see this in the US requirement of amendment ratification by three fourths of the states, the Australian system of double majority, Canada's complex model, which can even in some cases require unanimity. Um, so from um, our analysis of federal, of what federalism is, we need to ask the question, is this level of entrenchment justifiable? 
In asking this, we have to return to the purpose of federalism, um, which I argue is concerned principally with the protection of territorial pluralism. I've noticed that within liberal conceptions of constitutionalism, there is particular concern about the protection of individual rights, um, of political values within the constitution and not simply about institutions. A federal constitution, however, is established in a different way. What it does is bring together fundamentally a plurality of territorially based political communities, um, which are then given special constitutional treatment. So it seems to me that the purpose of entrenchment within a federal constitution is in the first order of things, not based upon individual rights, but upon the protection of territorial prerogatives, um, in particular autonomy on the one hand and associational government involving the territories on the other. So this leads to a second issue, what in institutional terms should be the focus of entrenchment within a federal system? Um, one point I think that emerges from this is that federal constitutionalism is primarily institution focused. It is principally um, about the balance of power between the territories and the center. And the emphasis of the constitution is upon that relationship. Another feature of federalism is that this relationship is very uneasy. That it's a, a trope that federalism encapsulates self-rule on the one hand and shared rule on the other. But in fact, this is a very uneasy constitutional arrangement between the autonomy of the territories and the federal government. And we see that in competence disputes. One argument, therefore, is that federal constitutions should in fact leave open avenues of deliberation and political decision making. That in fact, federal constitutions should not um, move from the initial institutional structure, which should be entrenched, to uh, further entrenchment of political values. The very fact that we have territorial pluralism within a federal system suggests that there it was not, at the beginning of the policy, necessarily agreement on shared political values and that the purpose of, of plural governments is precisely to allow dispute and disagreement and um, difference in the emergence of policy and values across the state. So therefore, we have a, a conundrum. On the one hand, federal constitutions are often very inflexible, such as the US Constitution. But on the other hand, it seems that we need avenues for um, full and open political deliberation and the, the arrival at um, political ag agreements um, by way of, as I say, by way of political rather than legal challenges. So um, this leads us to, a, to quite a, a, a difficult issue, given that federalism, at least at the level of constitutional theory, approaches constitutional entrenchment differently from a unitary system how do we deal with constitutional change? Should constitutional change be done simply through the territories, um, working together, in, for example, in Germany through the, the, the central legislature um, or through provincial agreement as in Canada, which is required for most constitutional change, um, or going further in, in terms of referendum where to take Australia as an example, where constitutional change requires a double validation, both from the central legislature and from a referendum, which itself requires um, a majority, not just across the whole country, but a majority of the Australian states. So next slide, please. So that what then can we say about referendums in the process of constitutional change? As I noted, referendums often sit um, uncomfortably within liberal constitutionalism because of the counter -major majoritarian position taken in relation to rights. But simply saying that the foundational purpose of federal constitutionalism prioritizes the institutional entrenchment of territorial prerogatives above the entrenchment of national values does not make federalism automatically more amenable to referendum democracy. If anything, the simple majoritarianism sim seemingly inherent within referendum democracy becomes even more problematic in a federal context. 
a federal system might not be ideal for entrenching um, a value-based approach, but it has entrenchment nonetheless. And simple majoritarianism in a federal system runs up against the carefully crafted constitutional order that is designed to protect territorial pluralism. So referendums do not, on their face, um, appear more attractive in a federal context than in a unitary context. This leads us to another major difficulty with referendums in federal context. Um, I mentioned the role of the referendum as a nation affirming or nation building tool, allowing a sense of popular constituent power to emerge at important constitutional moments. But I've also discussed how federal constitutionalism presents a radically different foundation for the legitimacy of a constitution. It is not in its origin necessarily a declaration of a, nat a national constituent power. In fact, it leaves the idea of a national constituent power to the side and says we have a plurality of territories. On that basis, how can one have a national self-determining referendum when we arguably do not start from the basis of one national people? The referendum brings to the fore the notion of the people, and it does so in singular ways. But the very notion of the demos in a federal idea is arguably far, far more complex than this. In fact, it raises the very question, who are the people? Certainly, a federal polity is one founded upon territorial pluralism, but it's also one polity. But as Dicey famously said, in a federal system, the inhabitants must desire union, they must not desire unity. A referendum seems to presuppose some idea of unity as a precondition for a people to make a collective decision. So next slide, please. So therefore, if we take territorial pluralism seriously, there are two opposing dangers in using constitutional referendums within a federal polity. One is unwarranted homogenization, positing the entire people of the state as one determining group when the constitution has in fact been crafted in a way that builds in complex and pluralized models of decision making to reflect the territorial pluralism of the polity. An example here is arguably the Brexit referendum in the UK. The UK, of course, is not usually characterised as a federal state, um, but I think it can effectively be so characterised. In the end, the referendum result was a vote to leave the EU, of course, by 52 to 48 across the UK. But there were majorities for Remain in Northern Ireland and Scotland, the latter by 62% to 38. This raised the, the issue of whether the UK was simply one demos, and indeed whether important constitutional change, and in effect this was a self-determination referendum, whether this um, decision could be taken by an undifferentiated people voting on a straight majority basis, or whether implicit in the gradual federalization of the UK is an implicit commitment to pluralize decision-making among the constituent territories of the state. Notably, the First Minister of Scotland argued that leave should have required majorities in the four nations of the United Kingdom. Um, and this dispute has continued ever since then. And as I say, in a federal system like Australia, referendums do require a majority, not unanimity, but certainly a majority of, um, of support across the states of Australia. The other danger with referendums in federal systems is the accentuation of demotic difference. So it's in a way the opposite danger. Federal systems are about pluralism, but they are also about union. Um, and they are about allowing people um, with shared and overlapping identities to belong to a system without having to commit to either or positions in terms of their identities. Certain referendums, in particular independence referendums, seem to force people to make choices about identities that they might prefer not to make. In this way, a referendum can be a very destabilizing force in federal states by bringing to the surface multiple political communities 
and by dividing them. We saw that in the referendums as the Soviet Union collapsed, as Yugoslavia collapsed, Bosnia in 1992 is the classic example, um, which tended to exacerbate the problem. But also more recently, um, we perhaps see these issues emerge in Quebec, in Catalonia, in Scotland, um, where independence referendums become source source of considerable dispute and an argument that, in fact, whereas there may be legitimate claims to self-determination, is a referendum the right way to go about it? Um, and if so, how does how should a referendum be used in that context? Um, the notion of ending a very complex federal relationship by way of a unilateral act um, and by positing a position um, of identity as a Scot, as a Quebecois, rather than as someone with mixed identities, raises all kinds of difficult questions. So therefore, is there a way to keep the participatory and deliberative advantages of direct democracy within a federal system? Given that the dangers of homogenization or separatism um, are clearly um, a threat to, to any federal system. And obviously referendums do play, take place at much more banal levels. And we see that in the American states, of course, which frequently use referendums. We see it in Canada in uh, referendums on the electoral system and so on. But it's at the heart of self-determination referendums that things become difficult. And I move now to my last slide, please. Just a couple more minutes um, and I'll be done. So, in the end, it's up to any particular federal constitution how it understands its own territorial pluralism. But referendums on self-determination force it to confront this question. Federal systems sometimes leave in abeyance what they understand by the demotic base, by the popular base of the federal system. But a referendum forces this question, whether it's a national referendum like Brexit or a subnational referendum, as in Catalonia, Scotland or Quebec. Um, on the one hand, it's possible to see the constitution as unbreakable. If you sign up to a federal constitution, then it is permanent. That's the approach obviously taken in the United States, but it's a similar approach is taken in Germany and Australia historically. Or you can say that a federal constitution is a specific type of constitution um, which relies for its survival upon plural constituent power, which survives into the federal system and which can revive at certain points. That would be the argument put forward by Catalan nationalists, Scottish nationalists, and so on. And that's the logic of secession referendums. The United Kingdom has acceded to that. The United Kingdom is the only federation to actively facilitate a secession referendum, allowing Scotland to hold one in 2014. It also guarantees Northern Ireland the right to a secession referendum under certain conditions. But we also see the passive, the passive acquiescence by the Canadian federal system um, to uh, the Quebec referendum in 1995, reiterated by the Supreme Court in the secession reference in 1998. As I say, that's a very different approach from the one taken in the US or Germany and certainly in Spain in recent times. On other constitutional changes such as Brexit, a similar question arises. How fundamental is the demotic base of territorial pluralism? Is the federal constitution representative of a collection of founding peoples with a specific form of pluralized constituent power that underpins the federal constitution? Or is there really just one constitutional people that can speak together as a national we? That was the premise of the Brexit referendum. I'm not trying to answer that question. I'm simply saying that the referendum within a federal system brings that fundamental question of the nature of self-determination within a federal system to the core. It's the very raising of this question that highlights that the referendum does not just unsettle democracy, it raises fundamental questions about how we understand the nature of federalism as a specific family of constitutional ordering. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Stephen, for uh, this wonderful presentation. Uh, let me see if I have uh, one person has a question, but there may be others. I, you know, I would like to encourage people to 
to participate. And in the meantime, I'll uh, pose the question uh, from Achilles Antoniades in the chat room. Um, and the question is, where do you place, I think this was written when you were presenting your taxonomy of referenda, where do you place the 2004 referendum in Cyprus? Now, remind me of that. Was that the referendum on the Anan plan, um, which was about the status of the TRNC? I'm not sure if our colleague is there. Uh, the answer is yes. Okay. That's um, in the chat. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't see that as a kind of referendum that takes place within a federal system. I mean, I would see that as a a post-conflict, um, if we if we can be optimistic enough to call Cyprus post-conflict, but I would I would see that more as a post-conflict referendum, an attempt to use a referendum to achieve some kind of peace settlement. I, I mean, I I don't. It's not a case I've studied in a lot of detail. Um, my general conclusion about referendums coming out of conflict is that a referendum is not a proxy for agreement. Okay, we saw that in the Colombia referendum in relation to FARC. We saw that in relation to Bosnia in 1992. That if you try and use a referendum to, to solve a problem, um, what you end up doing is giving the side with the majority the power. And in fact, you exacerbate a problem. And that's exactly what happened in Bosnia. Um, the contrast with that would be the Northern Ireland referendum in 1998. And what they did then was they reached political agreement among the unionists and the nationalists, the republicans and the um, loyalists, the UK and Ireland. And the referendum that went to the people was a, a confirmatory referendum um, to, to, to affirm the fact that there was already elite agreement. And it seems to me that that's that if, if you can characterize the Turkish referendum and or the Cypriot referendum in that sense, then 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 that's that is potentially successful. But um, as a, it's a referendum, is certainly not a proxy for political agreement. Thank you. I see a, another question uh, from Mari Manchai. I'm sorry if I mispronounced uh, the names of uh, some of the people in the audience. Uh, the question is, you mentioned that in federalism, they want union and not unity. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a phrase that comes from A.V. Dicey, who was the British jurist, a very famous British constitutional theorist of the late 19th century. Um, Dicey was an odd character because as well as being a theorist of the UK constitution and a very skilled theorist of the constitution, he got caught up very much in the Ireland home rule um, issue as a firm opponent of Irish home rule. Um, but what he was arguing there when he looked at other federal systems was that territories come together to form a federal state and they agree to a union. They agree, OK, we'll all live together, but it doesn't mean we're all the same and it doesn't mean we'll have one source of authority. Um, so we will live in a union together, but we won't have one unified government. So it, it, in a sense, it's a way of explaining what to us nowadays is, a, is the classic characterization of federalism, um, that it's union, but it's union with pluralism. Um, and, and, and that's where it comes from. And I, I use it in that sense. Uh, Professor Ponsati uh, writes, you have referred to Catalonia several times, but I'm not sure you imply that Spain has a federal constitution. Yes, um, I have a particular take on the idea of federalism, as I, as I think I've mentioned a few times. And the issue that I take with so much work on federal theory is that it brings to the table a very positivist institutionalist approach to what a federal system is and to what the category of federalism is. And from the slide that set out what I see federalism as being, um, 
I think it has to be understood through constitutional theory, and it has to be understood in relation to the inherent um, constitutional purpose of any federal system, which is a fundamental commitment to the territorial pluralism of its foundational constituent territorial actors. It's that constitutional commitment that, to my mind, makes a federal system. Um, so if I describe Spain or the United Kingdom as federal in that context, I do so unapologetically. Um, Professor Ponsati has a second question, but I'm going to bundle it with my question. I think it's related. And it's that to what extent, and I think it's related to your last point, you are not conflating the concept of federalist state with the concept of multinationalist state. There are federalist states that see themselves as a single demos, but they have structured um, the system as a way to, uh, as a, 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 let's say another check uh, or another system of, of balancing interests against each other, something like that. I think of these as, you know, perhaps the German case in a way. Um, it is true that it had a history of federalism, but after World War II, a fundamental objective in the federal design imposed by the allies was to make sure that it was really difficult to, um, or it, they, they preempted any takeover uh, that could endanger Germany again and Europe. Um, um, so that's a different category or animal than um, Canada, for example, or even Belgium, right? Uh, but then because there, there are all these cases of multinational states, which do not have federal structures. And that's where eh, many would say there is contention and a contention that cannot be solved, but through a some sort of uni unilateral protest or, or movement. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting question. What, the way I deal with that one, Carlos, is um, I don't accept there's such a thing as a federal state. I think there's a, I think there's a federal constitution. Um, multinationalism is, in a sense, a sociological um, categorization. So we look at countries like Spain or the UK, um, and we say they are multinational because they have, looking at it sociologically, they have internal territorial minorities that consider themselves to be nations. So that you can describe those states sociologically in that sense. But my sense is that federalism is not a category of statehood. It's a category of constitution. Um, and therefore it depends what the constitution says and what the constitution sets out to do. Um, now you can analyze that politically and obviously you can analyze it in terms of trajectory. And I would argue, as I think you're suggesting that both the American constitution um, over time has largely lost many of the, the fundamental trappings of federalism, uh, not institutionally necessarily so much, but certainly in terms of the notion of a plurality of constituent territories that, that give legitimacy to the constitution. Arguably, Germany never really had that from the beginning, that the federal constitution that was created in Germany was largely a functional apparatus for divided rule. Is that sort of what you're, you're suggesting? Compared to federations, federal constitutions that were much more overtly about the salience of territory such as Canada. I have another question, but I would like to, you know, uh, take advantage of my position mm -hmm. as the, uh, the uh, chair, let's say, of these to kind of explore a bit more, you know, what do you, this, the, this conversation uh, in a slightly different way. So it, it looks to me as if somehow when you talk about the federal constitution, you have in mind 
a, a kind of an optimal design. So there is this question of territorial pluralism, mm. and then uh, it seems that those constitution, though the, the the motive of the federal constitution is to preserve that territorial pluralism. Uh, and it seems to me that you were assuming in your discussion uh, that there is a certain success in, uh, in, in you know, that, that when you have that, then it, it, a referendum is a problematic thing. Uh, not, not illegitimate, not necessarily uh, something that should be uh, forbidden or avoided, but, but uh, that comes with considerable risks. Now, there are, I guess, many federal systems, and it may well be that some of them do not, uh, well, federal constitutions do not fulfill the mission yeah. that uh, gave, uh, you know, that sort of uh, led to their, the, uh, their approval, right? So because it's a federal contract in the way you your book uh, seems, you know, you're publishing. It may well be that those parts that went into the contract expected things that then suddenly uh, or, or over time uh, yeah. disappear from the table. And so then, you know, it must, this must mean that one should have a theory of referendums and their optimally designed and well-functioning federal constitutions and also under uh, systems that are not, right? Yeah. What I do, Carlos, I mean, it's a very perceptive and helpful question. What I do is, I, because I start from the purpose being territorial pluralism, it's not one that leads to a prescriptive approach to institutional design. I argue that sovereignty within a federal constitution, as in any constitution, is an essentially reflexive property. Sovereignty has to be understood as a relationship between the subjects and the site of authority. That relationship varies according to each federal system. In some federal systems, the demotic pluralism is actually not particularly important. It's not even important at the beginning. In others, it is fundamentally important and it remains fundamentally important and it can even grow. So I'm not arguing that a referendum is a universally good or bad thing in any, in all ref federal systems. I'm simply saying that when we think about referendums, it forces us to understand the nature of that reflexive relationship. So in America, it would be inconceivable for a state to propose a referendum on secession, given the, the nature of the American demotic relationship. In Spain and the UK, it is not um, unthinkable. In fact, one argument in Spain by Catalans and by Scottish nationalists is that the very nature of federalism in those countries of the constitutional contract is one that overtly kept alive plural constituent power. So there is one federal idea, but it manifests itself very differently across each federal constitution according to the kind of territorial pluralism that that country has. So it seems to me that then, you know, the, uh, within this sort of general discussion about the goods and the bads of referenda or referendums, um, there are some places where there are more goods than bads and some places where there are more bads than goods. Is that what you, would you agree with that? What I see is that it's, it's always a challenge, right? A referendum on self-determination is always challenging in a federal system. In some countries, it's simply unthinkable. In some federal, there was a, a court case in Germany just not that many years ago where the constitutional court really just laughed out of court the very idea that you could have a referendum to secede from the federal republic. Um, in others, that's not the case. So in, in Canada, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion that a referendum is a viable device. It's permissible. And if there's a vote to leave Canada um, under certain conditions, clear majority, clear question, then there's a duty to negotiate. 
that was still a very painful case for a lot of people. And the conclusion is very painful for a lot, for a lot of Canadians. Um, so there is something about constitutionalism, I think more broadly even than federal constitutionalism, there is something about constitutionalism that people do see as a fundamental, I wouldn't say permanent, but effectively a permanent act that can only be changed by a revolution. You know, it's a, it's a legal order. Um, and the referendum, even in the situations where there is an acceptance of multinationalism, is still a very problematic issue because, because a referendum presupposes a particular we, right? It, it's we are deciding, well, who are we? And if you have a referendum on independence, you are categorically framing yourself as a we separate from the bigger we of the state. Whereas a federal system, even in a multinational federal system, identities can be more are more fluid than that. So I think I would say that in, 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 even in federal systems that are multinational and accepted as multinational, the referendum is still problematic because it's a blunt instrument. On its own, it's a blunt instrument, unless it, unless it takes place like it did in Northern Ireland in the context of a much more pluralized kind of discussion and agreement. It can use Brexit could be another example of that. But the Brexit, part of the reason the Brexit referendum was so problematic for a lot of people is because it was not applied in the context of a wider debate about relations with Europe. Uh, thank you. I'm, just, you know, really I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Uh, of course you have. I mean, you know, I mean, these are, yes, you have, of course, the, the things that, you know, this leads to more questions. Yeah. But I want to, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to take, the, you know, all the, all, the, all the time. And I have a question that was open and then somehow it went to answer it, but I'm going to pose it in any case. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read it. Uh, this is from Sebastian Kopek. Uh, he says, hello, Dr. Trini, my name is Sebastian Kopek. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student at Seton Hall University studying secession. Secession theorists often like to cite the idea of a liberal theory of secession built on normative liberal values of self-determination. If referendums in federal states seemingly create a democratic paradox, is the creation of, I understand, a liberal theory of this liberal theory self-undermining? Yeah, well, hello, Sebastian. It's in interestingly, I used to, I, I taught international law at Seton Hall uh, many a, a number of years ago, so <laughs> um, it's a coincidence. Um, I find the normative theories of secession very difficult, um, and I steer clear of them. Um, the best book is by a Catalan. I don't know if Carlos knows Pau Bosacoma Busquets, um, a young scholar from Barcelona, a brilliant young scholar um, who has written, I think, the best book on, on the morality of secession. Um, but one of the reasons it is such a brilliant book is that it ties the issue of secession to constitutionalism. It doesn't deal with it in abstraction. And I think the problem of the liberal theories of secession, such as Harry Baran and Alan Buchanan, um, is that they offer at the level of abstraction, theory on a subject that amongst just, you know, when we think about political issues, the, the, the issue that is the least abstract is secession. It is such a fundamentally crucial constitutional issue when it arises in any particular context. Um, and when I started to write, my first book was on constitutional law and national pluralism. And I overtly moved away from international laws of self-determination because I thought it was a, it was a, a, a dead end. Um, you essentially had international law forbidding secession, except in the most extreme, extreme circumstances. And I don't think the law has changed very much since then. So I'm not sure these theories of morality of secession can be looked at in any meaningful way. I think secession can only be addressed state by state, constitution by constitution, in relation to what those constitutions say. Um, so I'm, 
I'm sorry you're not here to, to maybe help me reframe your question a bit more precisely, but um, I, I'm not sure I can make much of, of moral theories of secession. I think Sebastian is in our audience, but uh, you know, I uh, so I invite him to. If you are Sebastian, do point. come back and and clarify what yeah you want, yeah what you want to ask. Just came back in the chat. No, that answer was actually very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> Let me see if there are more. Uh, Questions. Let me ask a question then, you know, do you think that multi, well, not multinational, but supra, oh, there is a question by Clara is saying there's a question by AM. I sorry. I oh, yeah. this. No, these yeah. these are was already answered. You know, the uh you mentioned that in federalism they want unity and not union, not unity. So this one we yeah. Um let me let me ask you this question. Uh there do you think that supranational authorities have anything to say about um the monitoring or the uh, regulation of referendums in their member states so i'm thinking here of course about the european union but it could be other organizations and to me this is related to the fact that in switzerland for example um the uh, federal council uh, and federal institutions have had a role in, uh, in uh, steering, for example, the referendum that led to the secession of the Jura Canton from the Berna Canton. So do you see this as a possible way in which supranational institutions act as pacifiers and as, uh, let's say, policemen in the, in the you know, in a, sort of a traffic, uh, you know, jam? Um, or in a, they they sort of facilitate uh, ways to uh, to uh, to do the say this is related to the following thing also that you know I, I see if I may a lot of a status quo bias in uh, in, uh, in 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 some of the things that uh, you say but I find referenda attractive because they can be used. In, and I agree with you in, in lots of dangerous ways, but they are also guarantees. The national minorities can use that as a guarantee against a situation where they are always a minority, right? And the federal contract then is not working well because formally it looks like one, but then they are always, uh, uh, you know, uh, always loose in any kind of decision making procedures. But these are two. You know, to question. I, I, I'll, yeah, I'll stop here. Yeah, um, the supranational ones. Interesting. I mean, this, this, the Swiss situation really is, um, is a world to itself. You know, they've always had referendums within. Um, generally, you know, federal systems, because they're founded upon the basis of a certain territorial constituent power. You, you will find within federal systems a guarantee of the borders of the territories that um, that enter the enter the union, and it doesn't always stay that way. Um, we see that in in Germany there have been fundamental changes to the to the um, the lander. Um, we see it even in the United States um, historically. So it's it's a curious one, um, and it's maybe an indication of of a sort of dissipation. Of the fundamentality of territorial pluralism, if the constituents themselves are open to to abolition um, through the constitutional process, to merger or whatever it might be, um, 
So I think the, you asked you asked also about the the role of the European Union. Um, it is a curious one, you know. I mean, it, I don't know to what extent we can look at the European Union as a as a federal system. I, I in my work, I've focused only on states. Um, I also don't know to what extent you can look at the European Union in terms of a commitment to territorial pluralism. The European Union is its trajectory is very much. Um, towards a diminution of pluralism in the name of ever closer union. Um, that was its declared interest from the start. It doesn't seem that it has in any way moved away from that trajectory. Insofar, it has an idea of its constituents, and this is, I think, something that came up in 2017. It sees its constituent territories very much as state. And the, the response of the EU to what was going on in Catalonia in 2017, I think, reinforces the idea that insofar as the EU sees itself in federal terms, it has a very clear category distinction um, and it sees such pluralism as it contains as a pluralism that heavily favours statehood over other forms of territorial identity. Legitimately or not, I'm, I, 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 I don't know. That's, that's for, for people who are uh, involved in the EU to to reach a, a decision on, um. So, and your your other question, Carlos, was that were those the two main points you were raising? Um, well, I was basically, um, you know, um, talking about the possibility of thinking about referendums as, if used seriously and judiciously, as systems to guarantee certain rights of national minority. Mm. Because in a federal contract where for some reason, let's say that, you know, it has become corrupted or it's not, it has not reached the place that it was thought it would when it was agreed upon, then um, the national minority may have as a last resort uh, a referendum. And the majority knowing that it will be more cautious about taking measures that might encroach upon the rights of the minority. And I don't know if you have thought about this. Yeah, um, it's funny that you, you did note or you suggested a status quo bias, which is interesting because normally when I present on referendums in the past, I'm always seen as a sort of heret heretical constituent power secessionist, um, the fact that I'm daring to defend direct democracy. So I, I've never actually been outflanked from the other side as a, as a status quo positivist. Um, but, uh, but I take the point and, and, and I think what I'm talking about is the initial constitutional commitment. Like what, what, how was the federal system framed when it began? What was the idea of that pluralism? Was it um, more like the US where the states signed up to a form of union, but largely with a nationalizing trajectory, with a very clearly nationalizing trajectory from the beginning? Um, or is that a federal system that begins with a much more attenuated approach to unity? Um, and arguably Spain in 1978 would be an example of that. That, that the, the territories that signed up at that time um, had a very different approach. So you could argue that within those systems, so in Canada, in the UK, in Spain, those who present arguments for a secession referendum often present them in constitutional terms. They say, from our understanding of the nature of the constitution, we have the right to a referendum. Um, because the constitutional pact, the federal contract that we signed up to has been violated, right? Alternatively, a referendum can be seen simply as an act of revolution. We don't care what the, ref what the, con what the constitution says. We were forced into the constitution or the constitution has grown so hegemonic that we have no voice now. And that brings us back to the kind of morality of secession arguments. So, I, but what I'm saying is that that almost transfers to the realm of the political. 
we are asserting ourselves as a new original constituent power. We don't care about the old constitution. We reject that constitution and we are having our, we're having a territorial revolution here, like the Americans did in relation to Britain. So in answer to that question, there's two different routes. One is to argue that the federal contract allows secession because of the nature of that contract. The other argument is we don't care what the federal contract said. We didn't want it in the first place, or you've betrayed it. We are just going to have a extra constitutional process to reconstitute ourselves as a new foundational constituent power. You, so there's different options. There was one other question that I, I saw, Carlos, that I don't think I answered, which was, I think, from possibly from Madame Ponset, Ponsati about you have assumed that territorial pluralism is a pre-constitutional fact, but how do we deal with constitutions that deny territorial pluralism? I don't think I've dealt with that one. Please do. Uh -huh. Well, um, essentially what I'm arguing is not necessarily that territorial pluralism is a constitutional fact, but that a federal constitution is premised upon the idea that that's a fact because a federal constitution embeds a, pro, a, a foundational commitment to that pluralism in whatever way it does it. it. It might be through the amendment system, it might be through creating territorial levels of government or whatever. So it's simply an empirical observation um, and I'm not drawing normative conclusions from it. And as I've just said, it's possible that over time, the state can become so much more centralized that that initial commitment seems to have been um, traduced or betrayed or um, un illegitimately undermined. Um, but my simple claim is that a federal constitution on its face makes a commitment to territorial pluralism in different ways, according to the different federal systems. But every federal constitution inherently makes a commitment to territorial pluralism of some kind. have another question in the meantime uh, we are getting close to the end but let me let me uh, read it uh, and perhaps interpret it a bit uh, and it's the following and there is a premise that and I guess it's a you know a premise or an assumption you are making that um, uh, the, uh, the, the the person that asks the question doesn't interpret positively or um, and it's that we always have to rely on the constitution of a state. Um, and uh, I read, and it is this one, as a human person does, it depends on where you live, occupy one or another level because of those who have decided to incorporate or not in their con constitutions. Um, so yeah. let me rephrase this as, if I understand correctly, uh, um, there, are, there is one level which is the constitution of the state, but then there are some sort of fundamental rights that are above all these things. And I understand that the point is, um, if these fundamental rights uh, that probably include the protection of you know national characteristics of the minority are yeah. um, not uh, guaranteed, uh, shouldn't we then think of a referendum as a, a legitimate uh, yeah. tool? Yeah, I take that question. There, look, there's three orders of looking at secession. Um, one is the constitutional order, and that's the one I look at. I, I mean, it's what I, I, I look at exclusively. The two other orders are international law and political morality. And I, in a sense, I think you're asking the sort of bad situation question. I find myself in a constitution that I don't like. What can I do about it? My territory wants to leave. The constitution gives me no option to do that. What do I do? International law gives you almost no recourse. Um, European Union gives you no recourse, as Catalans have found out. Um, and you're then into the realm of political morality, possibly at the realm of human rights, but 
in terms of positive human rights, again, um, absent the kind of extremely abusive um, mistreatment of minorities that we that we saw in you know General Assembly Resolution fifteen forty one and so on, um, you don't have an avenue. So it is it is a very difficult question, and it's 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 one that. I think has been explored relentlessly in international law up to the Kosovo decision and so on. Um, but international human rights law, frankly, doesn't give you any avenue of secession. It might put pressure on states to treat minor minorities differently, um, but that's about it. And in terms of political morality, I, as I said, I don't really see much of an avenue there. People explore it and it's interesting, but it's, it's, it's not a practical solution to these issues. Thank you. Uh, I think that we are very close to the end of the time we had scheduled. I really would like to thank you, Professor Tierney, for sharing your thoughts with us. And I look forward to reading the federal uh, contract book, uh, which I understand is going to be published in 2022. And uh, is that right? Correct. Yeah, okay. OUP, so yeah, it should be out okay. next year, <laughs> hopefully. Okay, good. Um, and so I also want to thank you everyone that has come and uh, joined us for this very, very interesting and lightening uh, conversation. So, so with that, I'll, uh, you know, I'll just say that we are, as perhaps some, some of you know, we are meeting every month. We are not meeting in December, but we will be back with the uh, spring uh, term in Princeton. So in February, we have another talk and then again in March. And I look forward to having all of you uh, here again and many more if possible. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.